Welcome to One Work, Five Questions with Donna Vitek and Dr. Mark Andrew Holacek. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Holacek. Glad to be here. Got Duffy uh, sitting on the desk. and Aww. He's, get, he's getting his, his beard combed with my beard manager right now as we speak. Oh. Uh, the fleas and ticks off. <laughs> oh, with the sort of calls manager. into question whether it's just a beard manager now, huh? Could be a beard manager slash flea and pick home. Yeah, <laughs> it has dual purpose. Um, well, so thank you for joining us today. Um, where we are live on Twitter Spaces uh, for for the recording of this episode, and um, those of you who tune into Twitter Spaces, I will post the. YouTube video in the comments of the space um, if you want to watch the interview and then you'll be able to see the visuals that we have included in our show. Um, and today's topic is Thomas Jefferson to Peter Carr, a second letter. And this is his um, additional fatherly advice um, to his nephew, Peter Carr. You wanna go down? Yes, so. Um, Jeffy jumped down, so he uh, didn't want to be a part of this issue or something. Maybe, oh, maybe he doesn't, doesn't like Peter Carr. He doesn't want to be a part of it. Yep, I, well, he just, uh, anyway, he jumped up, so we'll see what happens. Okay, well, so last week, we covered a singular letter to nephew Peter Carr um, of August 19, 1785 concerning Jefferson's advice to Carr for study opposite to young man of 15. This week, we follow up last week's episode with a second letter to Carr two years later and filled with education instruction of a different sort. Carr is now 17 and ready for educational advice that only one man of greater experience can give to another. Of lesser yet the man of greater experience here is none other than Thomas Jefferson who was then the minister plenipotentiary to France. Um, so before we get started with our questions, I do want to do your credentials. I should have done that before I introduced the topic, um, but I'm so excited. Don't forget Alice. I, oh, I did have it playing. You didn't hear it? I had it playing in the background and then no, it was- No, no, don't, don't hear it. Oh, it was a little distracting, so I so I shut it. <laughs> oh, distracting's yeah. okay. Well, yeah. Now he's- uh... He's so, uh, 17 years old, so we're going to see what sort of difference that plays that hasn't uh, uh, last time he was 15. So we're going to get different uh, set of instructions for his education. I'm, Two years I'm, makes a difference. I'm excited because um, this letter was very specific, plus it had an attachment uh, that I found very interesting. Um so that that's something that people. And, and what were you doing at seventeen? Yeah, not not reading huh? um not reading Homer. <laughs> well, I can tell you, I was I was I was in the bars and uh, when I wasn't supposed to be and doing yeah. all sorts of bad things that a young man at the time wasn't well. I wouldn't say wasn't supposed to do, but climate was different back then. But uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> So, well, Dr. Holacek, for those of you who may want to use this for research, Dr. Holacek is a PhD professor of philosophy and history who taught at institutions such as University of Pittsburgh, University of Michigan, Rutgers University, Camden, and Ohio University. He is the editor of Thomas, um, the Journal of Thomas Jefferson and his time, and he has authored over or at 25 books, right? You're at the 25 mark? 25. Yeah, and um, over 200 essays. And the list of books and his essays can be found in the video description. Um, I highly suggest reading them. Uh, with our show, One Work, Five one work five Questions, I'll ask Dr. Holacek five questions on one work of Thomas Jefferson. Um, so I am Donna Vitek, and this is One Work, Five Questions. Are you ready for question number one? I, I'm ready. And I'm, okay. not, I'm supposed to give one answer to each question, not five answers, right? Well, one answer, try to keep it to three to four minutes per answer. That's impossible. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> okay, question number one. In last week's episode, Jefferson recommended to Carr 
um, study of history with the focus on Greek and Latin authors in Greek and Latin. Um, here he begins with not so dead Italian and Spanish languages. Why the shift? Well, Jefferson had this uh, profound love for the ancient languages, uh, Greek and Latin. And, you know, his grandchildren would say that he'd be found with a volume of, you know, Greek to, or Latin uh, poetry, prose, or uh, morality or history in his hands more than anything else. He just loved the ancient languages and he loved them in the originals. And he wanted all Virginian young men or all American young men to study Greek and Latin. Mm -hmm. But here he's gone beyond the, the grammar school. The grammar school that had preliminary education when you're really young, reading, writing, arithmetic, and so forth, and uh, you know basic writing skills, I guess, and and um, you have higher education, and Peter Carr is getting ready for higher education, like William and Mary College, and the idea is between those two, what do you do? Well, okay. you, you go to the grammar school, you know, and you study languages and so forth, and. Now he's getting ready for college, it's Greek and Latin, especially in history. Now he's getting ready for college, and Jefferson's giving him advice for modern languages. And he, he looks at Italian and Spanish. Um, doesn't say anything about French, but French is it's obvious that French is, is important. He says that before, uh, because so many books are great books in, in the natural sciences are written in the French language, so it'd be a crime if he doesn't learn French. He says Italian, he says, don't concern yourself so much with Italian because between Italian, French, and Spanish, it's all they're all derivative from Latin, right? And then he says, when people start studying French, um, Spanish, and Italian, what happens is that they mix all three of the languages in their conversation, and it becomes a sort of hodgepodge. And so he uh, tries to dissuade you know, um, Carr from studying Italian, but he's not so with Spanish. And and I suspect it's because of 1787, the, the letters written here in, in August 10, um, because of Spain's large presence in North America. Right. Right. Boy, were he alive today, would he really <laughs> think about that? Because, you know, so many Hispanic people in the country today, especially, you know, in the Western and Southern states. Uh, I lived in Colorado and Texas and so many Spanish speaking people living there. He would really, you know, he tells Carr, pick up this language because our future connections with Spain and Spanish America will render that language a valuable acquisition. Right. right? Um, and were he alive today, he'd say, my goodness, I never could have anticipated just how important that language would be. So he starts off with those two languages. Don't worry about Italian. Pick up Spanish if you can. Right. By the way, Jefferson, uh, it's, there's a story that Jefferson tells that when he sailed on the series to uh, France, he took Don Quixote, the great book by Miguel Cervantes, mm -hmm. in Spanish. And you know he learned Spanish by reading it in Spanish and having a dictionary. That story is not true. Uh, we look at Jefferson's program of study at William and Mary, he took Spanish. So when, even though he probably took Cervantes' book with his dictionary, he wasn't learning Spanish anew, he was rushing up on his Spanish. Right, right, okay. So he knew Spanish, some the rudiments of Spanish, he was brushing up on it. Okay. Um, question number two. Last week, Thomas Jefferson gave Carr advice on moral sensing, explanation of what the moral senses was and how it could be honed. Here he tells Carr to eschew lectures in, in this branch, moral philosophy. Is this a contradiction? I, I like the way you said eschew. Could you say that eschew. again? Eschew. Eschew. Like eschew. <laughs> Bless you. You have a kerchief at all? Sure. Anyways, that's uh, uh yeah. You know, the re there, there's good reason for this. He says, I think it lost time to attend lectures in this branch. He who made us, i.e., God, would have been a pitiful bungler. He uses this expression twice. 
if he had made the rules of our moral conduct a matter of science. For one man of science, there are thousands who are not. What would have become of them? Okay, let's stop so far. Again, if we for one man of science, there are thousands who are not. So intellect is not right. so important for Jefferson, because there are very few Francis Bacon's and Isaac Newton's. And I would say Thomas Jefferson's for every yeah. one of those, you get a thousand or not. But everybody does have a moral sense. Right. So in some sense, we're talking about human equality. We can't base human equality in desert of rights on intellect because very few people have a high intellectual capacity. Right. right? Um, whites included. It's just but but not when it comes to moral sense. Man was destined for society where social creatures, his morality, therefore, was to be formed to this object. He was endowed with a sense of right and wrong merely relative to this, right? He says this sense is much a part of our nature as a sense of hearing, seeing, feeling. It's the true foundation of morality. So he's talking about it as seeing, hearing, tactility, right? All of which have, in some sense, organs, the eye, and so forth. Right. Uh, it, it's a it's a faculty of sensing, right? Just like seeing is, and, and a matter of speaking, right? So it needs to be cultivated. Uh, he says it's not the tokelon, the truth, etc., uh, the beautiful or the true. The tokelon means the uh, the the beautiful. So it's he's referring to the aesthetic sense here. It's not truth, uh, as fanciful writers have imagined. Truth is not. In other words, if truth were the foundation of morality, then it'd be a rational thing. Right. My knowing something right or wrong has not do my reasoning, right? right? Because all people can sense right or wrong, and right. not all people are equally rational. People don't see that as sense. Um, it says the moral sense is as much of a part of man as his leg or arm. It is given to all human beings in a stronger or weaker degree as force of members is given to them a greater or less. So imagine just like strength. You know, I have physical, some people have physical strength at birth greater than other people, that doesn't mean that the person of lesser physical strength uh, can't enhance her physical strength by exercise. Everybody right. can. So some people have a lesser sense of morality than others, just as sort of as a freak of nature. Not greatly diminished, but through practice, you can make up for the deficiencies. I, I went from a 165 weakling at some point when I used to run a lot and play at 510 to I weighed up to 285 as a, as a strong man power lifter at some point uh, and lifted all kinds of heavy stuff. And uh, uh, so, you know, the idea is the moral sense too. Now, that said, um, he says a shoe lectures because lectures are going to talk about rationality. We already know. Do do I need a lecture on, on seeing? No. <laughs> no, I mean, you just see. Right. Do you need a lecture right. on hearing? No, you hear, right? You might get a lecture, so if you want to be inclined towards good music, say classical music, I might want a lecture on refining my hearing so that I can understand, I can listen for subtleties of musical expression that I had, uh, of which I had not been aware of prior to having, you know, lecture on that or something. So right. I, I don't need, he says, just avoid lectures, right, um, on that because they're not necessary, right? Mm -hmm. It's just sort of looking, it's like having a lecture on tasting. Well, I know how to taste. It just occurs right. naturally, things I, I like and I don't. Um, Okay, so he says it's strengthened by exercise as a particular limb. So in other words, under use of my moral sense, I might know what's right or wrong. If I don't practice it, right, my moral sense faculty is weak. Right. I can overdo it. You know, I, I can overdo it or fly off the handle for any perceived sense of injustice. In such an extent, I overdo it just like um, lifting too much weights, trying to get too strong, and all of a sudden you, you break it, you, you, you sever a tendon or a ligament, and you can't do things anymore. So you can overdo things so that when you are really needed to perform some morally correct action, you can't do it because you, you're, you're, you're pooped, as it right. were. 
Uh, he, he says the sense is submitted in some small degree to the guidance of reason, but it's a small stock which is required for this, even less than what we call common sense. Very important passage. A lot of people, Adrian Koch, Gene Yarbrough, and a lot of people will say, well, how do we cash out? And I've done this in several publications. Um, why, in what manner does reason come to the aid of the moral sense? I think when a morally superior person is involved with a morally inferior person, for example, in different cultures. Uh -huh. um, a lot of people say Jefferson talks about how different senses of there are different senses of morality in different cultures. Uh -huh. So moral, moral right or wrong is culturally relative. And Jefferson right. says that twice. Yeah. Right? If that's the case, then there's no real right or wrong for a human being. That's not what he means. Uh -huh. If I go to a Native American society where they think scalping is the right thing to do, right? Yeah. Uh, I can't just walk up to everybody and say, yeah, that's just wrong. They'll right. probably scalp me. Right. They have yeah. to be sort of sensitive to the degree, in Jefferson's language, the degree of moral retardation. Right, uh, right. Uh, a hardened criminal who's, who grew up in an environment where his father was a killer, his mother was a killer, so he's a killer. You can't just go up and say, you know, killing's wrong. Right. Well, there's something with the dynamics there that has to be more subtle and so forth. Uh, lastly, he says, state a case, a moral case to a plowman, a farmer, and a professor. The plowman will probably get it right more often than the professor. Right. Because the professor's thinking about it. The plowman just knows. Right. Again, this is a very strong case that Reason needs to stay out of moral decision making. A lot yeah. of people think yeah. no. A lot of people have argued, a lot of very serious scholars have argued no. Reason is the final arbiter in all of our, that's what he means by a small degree. Well, you, you make the decision based on feeling and then it has to pass the test of reason. No, that's not what Jefferson means. Whenever you pass the test of reason, reason is going to screw things up 95% of the time. The reason right. can be an asset in culturally different climates, for example. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty good answer to that question. Yeah, that, that was very full and robust. Um, <laughs> well, well, question, robust number, question number three. Um, there is a lot of religious... Did I state that with large, large S? Uh, <laughs> yo, you're going to get a it's large, nice large S knuckle sandwich. <laughs> All right. Okay, there's a lot on religious instructions. Why here and not in the earlier letter? And Well, we answered that in the prior letter, um, prior episode, because his reason is not, you know, you got all these books you brought up, good, you know. Yes. Look at all the different religions, right? Yes. Um, the Stoics philosophers before Christ often said, you know, Give me a child to the age of six, I'll have him for life. And in one case, another Stoic said, give me to the age of 12. The idea being, a child is born, a child does not have a full capacity for think thinking through things. Right, right. So what happens if you introduce, um, and, and Jefferson's right here, if, if I'm a hardcore Christian and uh, I introduce my child to Christianity with a great deal of febrility, of religious fever. There's your word right. for the day, febrility. Febrility. I got to write that down. <laughs> um, so, so my approach is febrile, it's feverish. Um, the child's going to be an ardent Christian, or what's the other? Uh, you know, if I if I shove religion down his throat, he's going to be a hardcore Christian, or what else? Uh, atheist. An atheist. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, there's only two things. You're not going to go out and be a moderate. It's just you're doing too much, right? right? We see that in the in the sexual protests today. We're allowing people for, you know, expression of the different sexualities, but it's being overdone in cases, right? Mm -hmm. Where people show disrespect for other people's religious views. Um, that said, so um, it was a question. Okay, okay, so he has to have, there has to be, he says, under religion, your reason is now mature enough to examine the object. It wasn't two years ago. Yeah. All right. So um, he says, he gives him certain methodological instructions. First, 
remove all your biases. In other words, all the things you think about what is right or wrong, apropos of religion, put them in abeyance, put them on the back burner. Huh. Second, right? Um, shake off your prejudices and fears. Mm -hmm. What might be a fear? Well, you talk to, for example, I bring Christians up not because I'm picking them, but I just, you know, I grew up as a Christian and that's what I know. I know Catholicism. Yeah. But one thing is, is that, you know, like following Pascal's wager, I believe, right? Because it's stupid not to believe. If I don't believe, I'm definitely going to hell. There's a good chance I'll go to hell. Whereas if I do believe, I might be able to go to heaven. No, so you're I'm still God. going. No, I'm joking. Well, the, the, you know, I, I might be happier there anyways. It's, I hear it's warmer. <laughs> you know, I'll be there with you. So. You don't have to pay the heating bills, right? Um, I know one thing. It's down there. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Then he says, fix reason in her seat. Mm -hmm. In other words, you can't just think rash. You can't think rationally without putting aside all your biases. Uh -huh. Keep your mind completely open. Throw out all the way you think about everything. Forget about it. Fix reason and intercede. Sort of like Descartes in uh, Discourse on Method. Uh, he says, entertain all options, even atheism. Begin with your own religion. Then he says, God will not mind. Right whatever happens after that right. because his view is god is a is the consummate rational culture and if you really go about this enterprise the right way jefferson thinks you're probably going to come up with something like he thinks that there's a god who created everything and who is a very good and almost perfect being and who got everything right the first time hence deism not theism um right and but if you do make a mistake along the way a God who knows that you have been sincere is never going to punch you. Right. Because right. you're really trying to do this honestly. You're you're openly right. trying to investigate the nature of God and so forth. And uh, I like that. Mm -hmm. Right? So um, he says, let's, let's see. Okay, here's, here's the, uh, he says, question with boldness, even the existence of a God because if there be one, he must more approve of the homage of reason than of blindfolded fear. So in other words, if you're um, even entertain the notion that there is no God, mm -hmm. and God's not going to damn you for that, because, you know, if, if I'm looking at it this way, well, I'm afraid to even think about atheism, because I don't want to go to hell. Right. God has, Jefferson's view. God has no respect for that. God wants you to use your faculty of thought that's given to you as fully as possible. Right. Um, and then he says later in the letter, uh, do not be frightened from this inquiry by any fear of its consequences. If it ends in a belief there is no God, you will find incitements to virtue in the comfort and pleasantness you feel in its exercise and a love of others which will procure you. Right. Uh, so in other words, if you come to believe there's no God, you'll be softened and placated by uh, virtuous activity, right? Mm -hmm. you'll, you'll still be drawn towards virtuous activity, and you, you will be a, uh, a socially desirable person that way. If you believe there is a God, um, and if you believe that you're under his eye, he approves of you, this will be a vast additional incitement. Uh, if that there is a future state, Jefferson doesn't believe in a future state, but he says if you believe there's a future state, the hope of a happy existence in that increases the appetite to deserve it. If that Jesus was also God, you come by a belief of his aid muff. So he's looking at all the options. He doesn't believe Jesus was a God. He doesn't believe that there's an afterlife, but he's telling Carl, think about these things. Don't, he's not telling Carl what he thinks. He's telling Carr you need to explore all your options, right? right. Um, he ends by saying, your own reason is the only oracle given to you. Oh, what happened? <laughs> okay. Something died. But he says uh, you're answerable not for the rightness, but the uprightness. In okay. other words, sincerity and integrity in your 
process is so much more important than right whether you get it right or wrong. Right. Um, I say well, something similar. I've always said something. Go ahead. Oh no. Uh, no I've, well, always, I've, I've always said something similar to people about my own scholarship because something that a, a historian from LSU, Andrew Bruce Jefferson Scholar, said to me. He says, oh, Mark, I don't always agree with you, but I feel I have to read you. And I thought, what a really cool thing to say to another scholar. And I mean, I would rather be relevant than right. In other words, because it's impossible for a historian to write, and every statement I write is always going to be true. Can't do that. You're going to read, people are going to read my works years from now and say, well, Halchek got this wrong, that wrong, that wrong. And that's fine. Right. As long as I've got if I built on what other people have said and corrected their mistakes, if other people can build on what I've said, correct my mistake, we're going somewhere. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think Jefferson means here. Okay. So much. Oh, well, that leads us into question number four. Um, we're still on this topic. Um, Thomas Jefferson tells Carr to approach the Bible in a specific manner. Carr is to balance the claims in the Bible with his own experiences of the nature of things. He begins with the Old Testament and then turns to the New Testament. What can you tell yeah. us about 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 his approach? Well, he uh, Jefferson's Bible. Yes, you know we'll talk of this. Constructed his own Bible. He took the New Testament. He thought much of Jesus, and he. The Smithsonian edition, which I have, which is a photocopy of Jefferson's real book, the one that existed, and it's very much like what Jefferson constructed. It's a wonderful thing. Um, but he starts with the Old Testament, and he says, uh, you know, question, you know, it says, read the Bible as you read Livy. In other words, if you see things in the Bible that are questionable, right? question them. Right? right, and he's talking about things like you know, you know, there's an episode in the Bible uh, where was it Moses parts the Red Sea. Well, do you see people being able to part a sea by you know saying certain hocus pocus words or whatever? It just doesn't happen. Right. So the idea is use your own experience as a guide. Yeah. You know, Jesus at some point, what he had two loaves of bread and five fish, and he fed thousands of people. The idea being is, is not, not to make a mockery, but Jefferson is like saying, can I take two fish and five or five fish and two loaves of bread and feed all these people? It can't happen. It would be like me having a large party and buying a six pack of beer. And every time someone wants a beer, I go get one. And there's still a six pack in there, even though <laughs> I've been giving out beers all night long. Well, yeah. can that is that physically possible? And Jefferson says, well, you decide. Does it make sense based on your experience? He's drawing right. from David Hume, David Hume's essay on miracles. Oh, and okay. David Hume, a very, very wonderful essay. Uh, David Hume, a fellow in Paris, this very intelligent man at the time, gave the argument. He says, when you hear a report of a miracle, which is something which is a contravention, a violation of law of nature, right? Someone says, Holacek let go of the pencil. And the pencil stays in the air, even though it's not attached to anything. He says, what are you going to believe? Are you going to believe that a law of nature, which has been confirmed thousands and thousands of millions and billions of times, has been violated? There's a miracle. Or are you going to think that the person reporting is reporting falsely? Right. A wonderful example is that you know a lot of reports of UFOs uh, are reported usually right around 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning. Well, what happens at that time often? Bars close. <laughs> Bars are closed. You see some, You see an airplane in the sky with the lights flat. It's a UFO. Yeah. I've always been sort of fascinated by UFOs are always like Frisbees and stuff. And how yeah. that makes for efficient flight. I don't understand that. Why aren't our airplanes, you know, uh, constructed like frisbees. Right. Anyways, then he talks of the Bible. I'll try to keep this. Um, he says, study Jesus. Uh, people say he was born of God, that he's the son of God. Consider that. Um, 
Those who say he was a man of illegitimate birth, consider that. He had a kind heart and so forth. Um, so study the notion of Jesus. Was he just, as Jefferson thinks, and, and Jefferson's not telling Carr what he thinks. Was he a man um, who just was a great philosopher? Was he actually the son of a god? Uh, read the books in the Bible, the four gospels, and he said, um, he says, I have mentioned under the head of religion several other, right, read other books on the life of Jesus to help you on right. that. So he's inviting Carr himself. This is what I object to with the sort of wokeism on Jefferson. Uh, read Jefferson yourself. Think for yourself. All Don't right. follow the lead of other people. Gordon Reed says he had father and children, so it must be a fact. And everybody just does that without studying it. Study for yourself. You have a brain. Oh, it's Don't it's happening anything. today with yeah. um, a lot of things. Uh, Florida is supposed to, supposedly there's a travel um, hazard or ban on the state of Florida <laughs> is unsafe to travel to. And no matter how many times I tell people, no, it's not. I live here. Um, anyway. <laughs> You hear it, but but that's the whole point. We're living in a time where, yeah. uh, where Jefferson's day authority was undermined because you know the authority of the Bible, the authority of Aristotle. People were realizing all these things we thought for two thousand years wind up being false, and now we're going back to a time where we don't think for ourselves anymore. We take things on authority. So I invite our listeners, our uh, viewers. To take what I'm saying and what you're saying with the grain of salt from Grano of Salas and, mm -hmm. and, you know, go back to Jefferson and read the letter yourself. That's what, read it. Right, right. It's all a check right in what he says, his interpretation. So it's not, right. it's not a matter of taking everything I say for gospel. Think for yourself. Right. right. I like that. That's the, I wish the show was ending. That would, would have been a perfect way to end the show. Think for yourself. Question number oh, five. Right and we have about six minutes left, so I want to get to question number five. Thomas Jefferson ends with some thoughts on, on traveling. Um, Thomas Jefferson, to me, astonishingly, he's a, against traveling. Why is that? Well, yes, six minutes is time of plenty. It's just a very short answer. Okay. Um, he um, he went to France. I think he thought that it's very easy to get seduced by the entanglements of a different culture. Jefferson goes to France and he sees all this hundreds of thousands of people crammed into spaces and beautiful architecture, museums, uh, all sorts of entertainment. It's easy to be inveigled by that, to be seduced, to be ensorcelled. There's another word for you. To be ensorcelled by uh, the trappings of different cultures. Yeah. When he talks about the culture of France, he says people, even the wealthy people, are very, very unhappy. They go through the same routine every day, and it bespeaks a life of lack of virtue and confusion. Whereas, for example, the women go about, and wealthy women go about in cards and getting their hair done. and and uh, going to tea and dinner and trying to find out diversions. Whereas in America, in Virginia, the American woman takes attends to the household. She directs the sewing, the cleaning, the cooking and everything. And she's engaged in really life fulfilling activities. And, and the man is doing his non domestic chores outside. Uh, but it's easy for someone who's used to a simple life, you know, been exposed to something more complex and actually Jefferson thinks emptier to be ensorcelled by that. And um, yeah, and that's why I think he thinks that that traveling, you know, you lose your appreciation for what you have. And then sometimes he advises students, when you go to get educated, stay in America. Don't go to France. Don't go to England. Uh, because you'll adopt their habits and pouring and gambling and when you come back the simple virginia lifestyle will seem bland right right oh you know and i i'm i'm the opposite anytime i go on vacation i i realize it's not a vacation when you don't have the modern conveniences of home that you're used to using every day <laughs> i don't know <laughs> well, socrates socrates said something relevant here it's one of my favorite quotes 
uh, according to the Stoics, he said, you know, Socrates said something like the problem with people who always get excited about vacationing and they can't wait to go on vacation. And when they're there, they're always miserable. Yeah. <laughs> said, well, why is that? And Socrates says, because they take themselves with them. <laughs> that's a good, yeah, that's right. And that's the right. notion is, is that if you're a miserable person, yeah, essentially, you're going to be a miserable person on vacation. On vacation, the change right. Change the scenery. Right. Change the scenery is not going to make you not miserable. Right, right. Who's yeah. that handsome fellow on the cover of that book? Oh, that's that's Thomas Jefferson. Um, I, well, I did want to know this letter that um, we use today is that um, to Peter Carr. Is that in your book, The Scholars, um, Thomas it's Jefferson? Absolutely, in my book under okay. uh, Morality and Religion. That's okay, absolutely. Morality and Religion. Okay. One, one of my favorite, one of the most important letters that Jefferson has ever written, in my I, estimation. I and um and the list that he attached that's a list of perf um, recommended reading that he's giving to Peter Carr, right? The the attachment to the letter. Yes. Okay, so for those of yes, you, who see, uh, well, I want to I want to purchase all of those books. <laughs> those are Thomas Jefferson's recommended reading. So, <laughs> and you're you're going to be bored by ninety five percent of them. I can't see you reading Xenophon. <laughs> I can't see you reading Herodotus or or. or uh, <laughs> Suetonius or Tacitus. So. Maybe I can get them on, on audio and then listen. I, I'd probably get further. Yeah, but you're, my... you're probably still fall asleep in spite of the fact. Oh. <laughs> right? The books on morality says the Socratic Dialogues by Plato. Oh, wow. Um, uh, uh, Cicero's Philosophies, his moral writings. Cain's Principles of Natural Religion, which I've read a number of times. Wow. Helvetius, Helvetius is uh, L'Esprit de l'Homme. La, de the Spirit of Man, Locke's essay, Lucretius, and Trate de Moro et de Bonheur. Um, wow. Those are the books he recommends. Okay. Well, that, I think that, Under, uh, yeah, I can try. Um, so the next episode. All right. Next Close week, us we out. Have, we have a special show on the Declaration of Independence, Jefferson's first draft. So the draft we know today was not the first draft. So there are some important there's some important information about the first draft that um, we need to teach our audience. And uh, hi, Jeffy. <laughs> well, I'll okay. close it out. We got a minute. I'll let you close it. Okay. Um, next week we have um, so we have that and uh, our Fourth of July show. We're, we're going to answer the following question: Given um, the heavy edits of Congress. Um, can Thomas Jefferson be said to have authored the document? Ooh. Um, did Congress cut out any passages that were dear to Thomas Jefferson? And were the generalizations in the document applicable to all persons? Um, so let's, I, I can't wait till Tuesday to celebrate. Um, and if you'd like to contact Dr. Holland, yeah, that'll be fine. We'll, uh, you, could, you can reach him at we'll questions. at hotmail.com or at Twitter. And his handle is at Dr. Holichak. And my Twitter handle is at Donna Vitek 1776. Or his Facebook page. You're, 